Please forgive my New York accent. <laughs> Actually, I have a slight English accent because I live in England most of the time, but I don't speak like, like you dear brethren. And I'm so honored that so many of you have driven this distance to see a Yankee, <laughs> a Limey, and an Israeli. I've been asked to speak about the subject of Jesus in the Old Testament. Jesus in the Old Testament is what I was asked to speak about. Turn with me, please, first of all, to the book of Acts chapter 1. Verse 6. So when they'd come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? And he said, it's not for you to know the times of the epochs the Father's fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power, or dunamis, when the Holy Spirit's come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the remotest parts of the earth. Implicitly, Jesus said a time would come when he would restore the kingdom. But now he's going to ascend to heaven. He's going to be raptured. And even the apostles who witnessed his crucifixion and resurrection were taught by him three and a half years, and some of them had been disciples of John the Baptist before that. They still didn't get it. Okay, we know now you suffered for our sin and took our sin to give us your righteousness, and you died our death to give us your life, you rose from the dead and you're the Messiah. We know that. But when are you going to do what we expect the Messiah to do? Establish the kingdom. The throne of David that was lost with the Babylonian captivity is what they expected. Even the apostles didn't get it even after the resurrection. They still did not understand there were other things they didn't understand. Remember Peter needed further revelation about the salvation of Gentiles in Acts chapter 10. And then, of course, in the book of Revelation, there were things even the apostles didn't fully comprehend. The Lord had to show John, the last living apostle. The Lord had to show Peter. Okay, The Lord had to show what was going to happen. They didn't know. They just couldn't understand why he didn't establish the kingdom. Now, it has to happen. Well, let's go to Luke chapter 7. Verse 18. The disciples of John reported to him about all these things. Summoning two of his disciples, John sent them to the Lord saying, Are you the expected one, or do we look for someone else? We're speaking here of Jesus' cousin, Yohanan Hamatbil. Filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb, he, rest, he recognized Jesus antenatally before he was born. He recognized Jesus from his mother's womb. He was the harbinger. He operated in the spirit and power of Elijah. And even John the Baptist, who Jesus said was the greatest man who ever lived up to that time, there was none more righteous than John according to the standard of the law, the Torah. Jesus said there was none born among women greater than John. This is the greatest guy there ever was up to that point. He didn't get it. He sends his disciples, I just can't, I know you're my cousin and you're the Messiah and all of that stuff and we grew up together and I noticed, but, uh, and I saw the Spirit descend on you in the Jordan when I baptized you, but uh, this just isn't adding up, Jesus. Are you the one? Or should I look for another? The apostles don't get it. John the Baptist, his cousin doesn't get it, his family doesn't get it. They don't get it. No. Right from the nativity, 
Herod asks, where is he who's going to be born, the Messiah, in Matthew chapter 2? Where is he who's been born king of the Jews in Matthew 2.2? 2, 2? They had this concept of the Messiah was going to come in the character of King David, re-establish what was lost with the Babylonian captivity, but then there was something else they expected. Look at John chapter 10. Verse 22, at that time, the Feast of Dedication took place in Jerusalem. That's known as Hanukkah, or the Feast of the Maccabees. The Maccabees deposed the Greeks, specifically Antiochus Epiphanes, who's a major picture of the Antichrist, set up an image of himself in the temple, actually the god Zeus, giving Zeus his own features, and it's a major picture of what we call in Aramaic, the abomination of desolation. And the Maccabees liberated Jerusalem. But then at Hanukkah time, they had a tradition. The Maccabees had a problem when the temple was rededicated. Antiochus slaughtered a pig, an unkosher, an unclean animal, on the altar. And the altar, the stones were what we call Mekudesh, holy, set apart to God. They couldn't throw the stones away and they couldn't keep the stones as an altar. So they dismembered the altar into stones and stacked them in Solomon's portico. And they believed that Hanukkah, the Messiah, would come and tell them what to do with the stones. <laughs> well, when the Messiah came at Hanukkah, they picked up the stones and tried to kill him. <laughs> they wanted a Messiah like the Maccabees. They expected a Messiah who was going to get rid of the Romans the way that the Maccabees got rid of the Greeks. Liberate Jerusalem, restore the temple. That was their thinking. That was their thinking. Now, that was the popular thinking. But even John the Baptist thought that way. Even the apostles thought that way. Nobody got it. Nobody got it. These were people who knew Jesus, who were taught by him, but they still didn't get it. That's the way it was in his first coming, and that's the way it's going to be in his second coming. Even people who know him and love him, who expect him to come, so many of them, so many of us, have preconceived ideas, ideas that come from church tradition, ideas that come from looking at certain scriptures but ignoring others. And they had this idea of what it's going to be like when he comes. But it's quite different than the things that are likely to happen or that are going to happen. They didn't get it the first time. Even at the end of the first century, Jesus had to give the revelation to John on Patmos. Now, it's not going to be like that, John. It's going to be like this. He's always tried to straighten the church out. It's, it's not going to be like, it's going to be like this. Right now, the Holy Spirit is trying to straighten us out. It's not going to be like that. It's going to be like this. We've all seen charts, we've all heard sermons, we've all watched videos on the internet, and they all have it all figured out, and this, 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 that, a timeline. It's not going to be like that. It's going to be like this. They saw him in the Old Testament the following way. My apologies to those who know this. The Jews... At the time of Jesus, and the rabbis, the Orthodox, still believe this. They see two messiahs. We know it's one messiah with two comings. But they believe it's messiah son of Joseph, messiah son of David. 
Hamashiach ben Yosef and Hamashiach ben David. They confuse the two. The son of David comes as a conquering king in the character of David. He indeed liberates Jerusalem and establishes God's kingdom. The reign of David and Solomon are types, shadows of what the millennial reign of Christ is going to be like. When there was peace all around and David ruled with a rod of iron as a type of Christ. Jesus being a direct descendant of King David. Does that Davidic Messiah, as we call him, that conqueror, that king, that guy who's going to do what we expect him to do. But he also did things they didn't expect him to do. They didn't understand about this person who the rabbis called Ben Ephraim, Ben Ephraim identified with the suffering servant of Isaiah chapter 52 and 53. The more ancient Hebrew translations into Aramaic say it's Isaiah 52 and 53 are about the Messiah. Now the rabbis don't believe that. They say it's about the Jewish people ever since the Middle Ages, but originally they said it was about the Messiah. You can prove it. Be that as it may, Son of Joseph, son of David, Hamashiach ben Yosef, Hamashiach ben David. Joseph has to be understood in terms of sonship. When you speak of sonship in biblical Hebrew thought, it does not primarily mean pedigree. It may entail pedigree, but that's not what it means. Sonship means in the character of in the character of. A big theme in the time of Jesus that was heralded by the Essenes was the sons of darkness versus the sons of light. Those who are in the character of the light, those in the character of the darkness. Even the Zoroastrians in Persia had this concept. Jews are called people of God, but then there's the sons. Sonship. Remember after the transfiguration, Jesus told Peter in Aramaic, Shimon bar Simon son of Jonah. Well, Peter's father's name may have been Jonah, but what Jesus was saying to Peter is something different. You are in the character of the prophet Jonah. Remember at Jaffa, the biblical port Jaffa, today on the south side of Tel Aviv, modern Tel Aviv. Jonah was called by God to go to the Gentiles at Nineveh when he was in Jaffa. He didn't want to go to the Gentiles. God had to deal with them, remember? So, at the house of Simon the Tanner, in Acts chapter 10, where is the house of Simon the Tanner? Same place, the port of Jaffa. Now Peter's in Jaffa, and God calls Peter to go to the Gentiles, to Cornelius and his family. Peter doesn't want to go. God had to deal with him to go to the Gentiles. Peter was in the character of Jonah. You understand what the scriptures mean? Well, Messiah, son of Joseph. He's in the character of Joseph from the book of Genesis. It's fortuitous that Jesus' foster father name was Joseph which means he shall add or Yahweh shall add. But let's look at Joseph. Joseph was the beloved son of his father, and he knew the sin of his brothers. Like Jesus. Joseph was betrayed by his Jewish brothers into the hands of Gentiles. God took that betrayal and he turned it around and made it a way for all Israel and all the world to be saved. Jesus was betrayed by his Jewish brothers into the hands of Gentiles, and God takes that betrayal and turns it around, making it a way for all of Israel and all the world to be saved. Okay? Joseph is betrayed by his brother Yehuda, Judas, for 20 pieces of silver. 
as I put it, adjusted for inflation, Jesus is betrayed by Yehuda, Judas, for 30 pieces of silver, the son of Joseph, okay? Joseph was condemned with two criminals, and as Joseph prophesied, one would live, one would die. Jesus, the son of Joseph, was condemned with two criminals, and as he prophesied, one would live, one would die. They bring Joseph's cloak to prove he's not in the pit. They bring Jesus' shroud to prove he's not in the tomb. Joseph goes from a place of condemnation to a place of exaltation in a single day. Jesus, the son of Joseph, goes from a place of condemnation to a place of exaltation in a single day. Upon exaltation, all power and authority was given by Pharaoh to Joseph, and every knee had to bow to him. Jesus, the son of Joseph, all power and authority will be given to him by the Father, and every knee shall bow. Joseph, upon exaltation, takes a Gentile bride. Jesus, the son of Joseph, upon exaltation, takes a Gentile bride, the church. Okay? Predominantly. Okay? You can go on and on like this. There's about at least 30 to 40 major contrasts. But for the sake of brevity, I'm only touching on some of them. The main point being, though, that Joseph's Jewish brothers did not recognize him at the first coming. In their desperation, they recognized him at the second coming, and they wept bitterly. Remember? When Joseph revealed himself to his Jewish brothers, it says he sent his Gentile servants away. After the Gentile church is raptured, resurrected, removed, Jesus will personally, as the son of Joseph, reveal himself to his Jewish brothers. Look with me, please, to Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, if you don't know. I will pour it on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication. They will look upon me who they have pierced, crucified. They will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son and weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. His brothers recognize him at the second coming, at a time of desperation. This one we rejected, this one we betrayed. This one we thought was for the Gentiles. Just like Joseph, they thought he was an Egyptian. He looked like an Egyptian. He talked like an Egyptian. They thought he was for the Egyptians. He's our brother. This one we rejected and cursed is going to save us. They wept bitterly over Joseph. And they will weep bitterly over the son of Joseph. They don't recognize him at the first coming. They recognize him at the second. You understand? Messiah, son of Joseph, Hamashiach ben Yosef. Then there's the son of David. He's the conqueror. They all wanted the son of David. More of that in a moment. They didn't want Ben Ephraim. They didn't want the son of Joseph. They didn't want a suffering servant who was saying, pick up the cross and follow me. Well, in his first coming, he comes to deal with, free us from sin. In his second coming, he frees us from the dominion of Antichrist. You understand? This political Messiah, as it were, Messiah will set up the literal kingdom. That's his second coming. His first coming... He comes to save us from sin. In his second coming, he comes to save us from 
Satan in the person of Antichrist and to save Israel. But let's understand this now. The other idea they had, rightly, and it's amazing how much Orthodox Jews know and how blind they are. It's amazing to be somebody holding all the cards and can't put them in order. To play the right hand. They got the cards in their hand. To them belongs the oracles of God. They're holding all the cards. But they can't put them in order. Ten jack, queen, king, ace. Same color, same suit. Deuteronomy 18, 18. I will raise up a prophet from among your countrymen, their countrymen, like you, like Moses. Put my words in his mouth and he'll speak to them all I command him. The Messiah would be a prophet like Moses. He would give a covenant. God would give a covenant through the Messiah. He gave the first covenant, the Torah, through Moses. Moshe Rabbeinu, the Torah. And he'd give the second covenant, what we call Habrita Hadashah, through Yeshua, through Jesus. He'd be a prophet like Moses. Well, let's look at Moses. The first, he was the prince of Egypt, accepted by the Gentiles. But the first time he tries to save Israel, (laughs) they reject him. Forty years in the wilderness of Midian. They reject Moses the first time. He goes. And upon his rejection by his own people, what does he do? He marries Zipporah. What was Zipporah? A Gentile bride. (laughs) Prophet like Moses. When they get desperate, really desperate, under Pharaoh, they accept Moses the second time. Now, most of you know the way that Pharaoh's magicians, Jonas and Jambres, counted the miracles of Moses and Aaron is a picture of the way the Antichrist and false prophet are going to counterfeit the miracles of Jesus and, and his witnesses. Okay, you understand what I'm saying? It's, it's a satanic power to do these things. It's a picture, a type. Only the second time, when they're really desperate under Pharaoh, a type of the Antichrist, who was worshipped as God by the Egyptians, they deified him, like the Antichrist will be. Only when they're really desperate, facing extermination, worse than Hitler, do they accept Moses? Jesus will be the same. Messiah, son of Joseph, will be the same. The prophet like Moses, the same. The guy with the Gentile wife who married the Shiksa, he's the same. They'll accept him the second coming. They had these expectations that although they were true. They only looked at certain aspects. They don't look at the whole picture. They had these pictures of the Messiah in the Old Testament, like Joseph, like Isaac, like Joshua, certainly like King David, like Moses. Like Jeremiah was called the sheep for slaughter. All of these Hebrew prophets were types of Christ in some way. They were all shadows of the Messiah. Every judge of Israel, every male judge at least, every patriarch, every prophet, somehow their life and their experience and what they did foreshadows Jesus but especially Joseph, Moses, and David. When Stephen is facing martyrdom in the book of Acts chapter 6 and 7, 
and he recounts Israel's history, notice who he focuses on. Joseph, Moses, and David. The reason you're doing this to me is because you reject Jesus. Why did you reject Jesus? You reject Jesus because you rejected Moses. You reject Jesus because you rejected Joseph. King Saul tried to kill David. That's why you're doing this to me. Because you're doing it to Jesus. He's the son of Joseph. If you did it to Joseph, you're going to do it to the son of Joseph. And they're going to do it to us. Because we are called to be in the character of Christ. I like this building here. I like meeting nice Christians from the American South. I like the Southern culture. I really do. But you know what? As we meet and sing and pray and fellowship today, there's politicians from the American South saying that if you will not allow a lesbian to be your pastor, if you will not perform a same-sex marriage, contrary to your faith-based convictions, your building is no longer tax-exempt. We're going to tax your church. This is what they're trying to do. And they will do it sooner or later. Why? Why are they going to do this to us? Because they did it to Jesus. Because they did it to Joseph. Because they did it to David. Because they did it to Jeremiah. Because they did it to Moses. What do you expect? But again, there's so many Christians I know who love the Lord, they don't learn the lesson of Israel. They expect things that are not realistic. The sequence of events are not what they think. I mean good people, credible people. Remember, John the Baptist, the apostles, they didn't get it. When's he going to do it? On the triumphal entry, the Gospel of St. Luke, they're singing, Hoshana, Hoshana, la ben David. Hosanna, Hosanna, meaning save us, save us, to the son of David. They wanted Jesus to come to the east gates of Jerusalem, Hoshana Rakamim, make a right-hand turn, knock down the fortress Antonio, and get rid of the Romans the way the Maccabees got rid of the Greeks and set up the millennial kingdom. That's what they expected him to do. Only when he came across the Kidron from Harzayatim, the Mount of Olives, and he went through the Shad Arachamim, the East Gate, instead of making a right and getting rid of the Romans, he made a left and went into Solomon's portico, and he got rid of Kenny, Benny, and Joyce. What they were singing to Jesus, sung ritually, it's known as the Hallel Rabbah, the great praise. It's sung twice a year. It's sung at the Feast of Tabernacles, just sung recently. Now, this time of year, it's going to be sung. And it's sung at Passover, Pesach. But the highlight, led by the Levitical choir, is what we read in Psalm 118. Look at it. What does Jesus say at the triumphal entry? Verse 22 of Psalm 118. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is marvelous. The Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice. Hava nismach. The Pharisees, the Sanhedrin said, tell the people to shut up. Jesus said, 
If these shut up, the stones will cry out. Remember what John the Baptist said about the stones? God could raise up Abraham's children out of the stones? Abraham was a Gentile. God converted to Judaism. 1 Peter 2.5 We are the stones of the temple. Jesus was referring to the Herodian stones, but he's saying Christians are the stones. In other words, if the Jews don't proclaim me, the Christians will. You understand? The stones will cry out. That's what he was saying in Jewish metaphor. 1 Peter 2.5, we are the stones of the temple. Same thing in Corinthians. But let's look now at the Halal Rabban, Psalm 118, verse 24. Havan Ismach, let us be glad in it. O Lord, do save, we beseech you. Hoshana, Hoshana, Hosanna from Lehoshia to save. Hoshana, Hoshana, Anna, Hoshana. O Lord, we beseech you, do send us prosperity. <laughs> Yes, friends, name it and claim it. <laughs> Hallelujah. You just believe the Lord for that Cadillac. <laughs> and if you don't get it, it's because you don't have any faith. You have to act in faith. Now, if you send me a free will offering of $500, I'll put your picture in my Bible. Hallelujah. <laughs> As you sow, you shall reap. You don't have to suffer. You're a king's kid. Name it and claim it. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord, we beseech thee. Hoshana, Hoshana. Save us, save us. Give us prosperity now. There were three ways Satan deceived the Jews not to be ready for his first coming. Look with me, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. One of the most important chapters, passages in the New Testament. Verse 6, these things were written as examples for us. Verse 11, these things happen to them as examples for us. Look at the book of Romans, chapter 15. Whatever was written in former times, oh boy, the history of Israel was written so we would not make the same mistakes. Whatever was written in verse 4 in earlier times was written for our instruction. So through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Notice the encouragement comes from the scriptures. It doesn't come from motivational speaking. It doesn't come from somebody using motivational psychology with Christian jargon. It comes from the word of God. So, Paul tells us, Learn the history of Israel or you will make the same mistakes. They had 2,000 years, 2,000 years of history. They had the scripture. They had an Old Testament understanding of the Messiah through these types, shadows of him, Melchizedek being another. 
Going back to Abraham, it was 2,000 years God was preparing them for the coming of Jesus. And except for a handful, none, including most of the religious establishment, none were ready. You think it's going to be any different when he comes again? We've got 2,000 years of history. From the time of Abraham to the time of Christ, from the time of Christ to our time, just as long. God dealt with them 2,000 years. When Jesus was around, Abraham was 2,000 years ago. Same as when we're here, Jesus was 2,000 years ago. It's a long time. We have the scriptures now. The old and the new. And we say we believe he's coming. <laughs> they just didn't get it. And I'm afraid most of the church just doesn't get it. The first lie that they bought into. Hosanna, Hosanna. Give us prosperity now. The word faith thing. You know where that came from? The occult. These guys like Kenneth Hagen, and they got it from people like E.W. Kenyon, who were influenced by occult practitioners. It has the same root as Christian science. The Christian science cult of Mary Baker Eddy, she taught old age is an illusion, illness is an illusion, and death is an illusion. Well, first she fell victim to the illusion of old age. <laughs> then she fell victim to the illusion of illness. And alas, voila la grande illusion. <laughs> she snuffed it. It's an illusion. My body's lying to me. It's like having a vision of hell. And you see Karl Marx in hell. He says, oh no! I was wrong! I'm in the lake of fire! I'm burning! Ah! And then Mohammed. Oh no! I was wrong! I'm in the lake of fire! I'm burning! <laughs> then there's the word faith money preacher. My body's lying to me. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta be nuts to believe that stuff. But they believe it. You've gotta be twice as nuts to give them money, but people do it. Defrauding honest ministries, honest churches, honest missions, honest charities that need the money and giving it to them. The corrupt clergy was running a racket. And they're running a racket today. That was the first. The second was they had a concept that the Messiah would set up his kingdom political dominion, kingdom now, triumphalism. We're going to conquer the world. Then the messianic kingdom is going to... What do you have today? Dominion theology? Kingdom now theology? Overrealized eschatology? We're taking the kingdom by force! Hallelujah! I wish they could read Greek. They think that means they're going to conquer the world for Christ before he comes. Rick Godwin and these guys. I wish they understood better Greek. That word, take the kingdom by force in Greek, it's, not to be crude, it's the same word for forcible rape you force your way into. In other words, it's like being on a cruise ship. And, and the whistle goes off, the ship is sinking. And people are desperately trying to get into life jackets and force their ways into lifeboats. The law and prophets are preached unto John. The law shows we're condemned. <laughs> now grace comes with Jesus and people are fighting to take them. That's what it means. 
Oh no, it means we're going to conquer the Name it and claim it. Now, if we ask according to his will, if you ask with wrong motives, James says you won't get it. We had a girls' school in Tanzania. It was a problem we had. Girls, maybe 14 through 19, 20. And school, we taught them scripture, obviously, basic computer skills, English, and dressmaking, so they didn't have a way to survive. This was an education in Africa we had this school. But we found out our Christian girls, this is in the Rift Valley in Tanzania, near Mount Kilimanjaro, our girls were getting raped. And they didn't want other black Africans to know it. They told us because we were Mzungu, white people. They didn't care if the Mzungu knew it. But it's taboo in, in tribal Africa to, to not have HIV. And we had a meeting with the girls, and we were just talking to them. They spoke Swahili, but we taught them English. I speak very little Swahili, just a bit. We were talking to them. And the teachers weren't there. It was just the Mazungu, me and my, our mission director from Africa. And, and, and they began asking, can you stop the rapes? I said, what? Can you stop the rapes? I found out that our girls at the school were going and the pagans, some of the Maasai, were raping our Christian girls. I nearly hit the roof. We had them all tested for HIV and pregnancy. We had like two pregnant and like five were HIV infected, something like that. What am I going to do? Look, we're going to have to house the girls at the school. It was worse than that. When we went to the police, the police wanted bribes. To, this is how corrupt the third world is. The cops wanted bribes. It's a long story. But we needed to build these rendezvous to house the girls at the school so they wouldn't have to go back to their villages. These are orphans. Their parents were all dead of AIDS at the time. This was before antiretrovirals were widely available in Africa. So I needed forty, fifty thousand dollars yesterday, at least twenty-five thousand to begin, but I needed forty to fifty thousand dollars yesterday to build these rendezvous. Jesus, give us this money. Jesus, we need this money to rape on our girls. I had the money in 24 hours. I didn't pray for a Mercedes. I asked according to his will. You can't outgive God. That's true. If I put every dime I ever earned into a collection basket, I couldn't even begin to make a down payment for my salvation. Prosperity. They had the wrong idea about the Messiah from the Old Testament. Oh, don't worry. When he sets up his kingdom, the meek shall inherit the earth. That's coming. Dominion, that's coming. But then they wanted him to put on a show. The only thing he had to do was entertain Herod with miracles. And he could have saved his neck. Herod would have intervened with Pilate, would have walked away a free man. But Jesus never used his divine power independent of his father. He only did what his father was doing. It wasn't about putting on a show. The scene by Niflaot in Hebrew signs and wonders. Well, don't worry, the Antichrist and false prophet are going to put on a show. They are going to put on one show. Remember, Jesus had miracles, but he never had a miracle crusade. He had healings, but he never had a healing crusade. He had a repentance crusade. Most of the time, when Jesus healed somebody, he'd say, that's between us, keep it quiet. 
I got you covered. Sin no more. He had a repentance crusade. How, after 2,000 years of history, having the scripture, how could they not see this? How could they get bamboozled by Satan? And it's written for our instruction. Now most of the church in the Western world is being bamboozled by Satan. And we are exporting these lies to the third world. This is the devil. But he's in the Old Testament. They just couldn't figure it out. Look with me, please, to Luke chapter 4. Verse 16. Now it says books, these are actually scrolls called Megillot. When he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, he was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath. Now remember, he was an itinerant rabbi. Jesus' real name was Rabbi Yeshua Bar Yosef Minetzeret. That was his real name. He stood up to read and the book would have been a scroll of the prophet Ishayahu Hanavi, Isaiah, was handed him. And he opened the book and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to proclaim re release to the captives and recovery to the sight of the blind, to set free those who are oppressed and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down and the eyes of all were fixed on him. Why? Why? All he did was read from Isaiah. Well, let's look at Isaiah. Let's look at what he read. Chapter 61, verse 1. This is what he read. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news in Hebrew, Besorah, and the Septuagint, Evangelion, Gospel, Good News. To the afflicted. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners. To proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. This would have been the Shana HaYover, the year of Jubilee. But let's look. And the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. The day of... He only reads half the verse and he closes the book. Rolls up the... He reads half the verse, sits down. Well, why didn't you finish reading the verse? In his first coming, he doesn't come to bring vengeance. That's in his second coming. You understand? That's the son of David, the son of Joseph. But look what else he leaves out. To comfort all who mourn. In the Beatitudes, it's future tense. We shall be comforted. We shall be comforted. But it doesn't say we're not going to mourn. He <laughs> says, blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who mourn. We don't have to mourn. We have the victory in Jesus. Hallelujah. They just don't get it. Like Israel, it was all there. It was in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Scriptures, what we call the Tanakh. It was all there. But they just didn't get it. They didn't understand the sequence. They didn't understand the context. And they wanted those promises and prophecies to be fulfilled on their terms, not God's. 
his second coming will be no different. So many Christians want the promises of Christ and in his second coming to be filled on our terms, not his. You don't have to suffer. You're a king's kid. Come with me next month to Vietnam. I'll introduce you to a man who was saved one month. The local communist organization in his village, in Diem province, burned his house down, killed his wife, four children, and another Christian. He and one child escaped. He'd been saved one month. I'll introduce you to a pastor who came to one of my meetings. I got out of there. If I get arrested, I get deported and banned. That's it. They took this guy. They bashed his teeth in. They locked him up for 18 days and bashed his teeth out. Then they let him go so the other people in the village would see what happens to evangelists who listen to Jacob Prash or somebody like him. Then they locked them up again. You don't have to suffer. You're a king's kid. I tell this many places. I have seen true Christians in Carolina. I've seen true Christians in Australia, New Zealand. I've seen true Christians in Canada. I've seen true Christians in Great Britain. I've seen true Christians in Holland. I've seen true Christians in many places. But I'm ashamed to admit the truth. Although I've seen and had the privilege of meeting true Christians in many places, the only place I've seen true Christianity, like the book of Acts, is where the church is persecuted. And I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling you the truth. This is the truth. It's not the way they think. We're going to get out of here. We got a free ticket out of here. We're going to be raptured before this happens right now. There's left wing politicians planning to close this church down. To force an agenda of sex education on your children and grandchildren. That if you oppose it, they'll say you're guilty of a hate crime. There are principalities. Why does God allow this? Why has God allowed this? <laughs> to clean up a backslidden church that's in love with the world instead of in love with Jesus. Oh, persecution comes from the devil. I've seen it. I've seen it. I mean, I've been to Saudi Arabia. I've been to China. I can't even go to China now. We have ministry in China. I can't even go there right now. You'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Remember the freedom you have here in the American Bible Belt. It's a historical anomaly. The founding fathers of America were influenced by parliamentary democracy in Britain to a degree. And it said on the parliament, Paranaster Quius and Chalius in Latin, our father who art in heaven. The founding fathers of America were not all Christians, but they all understood Christian principles. And they understood democracy can only work if we're based on Christian principles and we no longer are. You got that book? In the English language, hold it up like this. Hold your Bible like this. How much did you pay for that Bible? Ten bucks? It cost William Tyndale his life. It cost the followers of John Wycliffe their life. Oh, it's free. But it's not cheap. Like salvation. Oh, it's free. But it's not cheap. 
after 2,000 years. They can see shadows of Jesus in the Old Testament. But they configured it, configured it the way they wanted it to be. The only way Christians are going to be ready for his return and for the events that will precede his return is to stop configuring it the way we want it to be. It's not going to be like that. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, they said. Hoshana, Hoshana, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Baruch haba b'shem Adonai, barach nu hem ibet Adonai, hodu la Adonai kitov ki le olam chazdo. Hoshana, Hoshana, baruch haba b'shem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's what they said at the triumphal entry. But look what Jesus said when he wept over Jerusalem in Matthew 23, verse 39. For I say to you, from now on, you will not see me until you say, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. You won't see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Yeah, but we just said that to you the day before yesterday. He behaves as if they didn't say it. They said the right thing, but they said the wrong thing. They understood about Jesus, but they had him all wrong. They were singing Hosanna to the son of David. They should have been singing Hosanna to the son of Joseph. They wanted to know him in his victory and prosperity. They didn't want to know him in his cross, and either do we. This is the reality. Jesus in the Old Testament, always in the Old Testament, he's in Isaiah, he's in Jeremiah, he's in Hosea, he's in the Torah, he's in the Old Testament. He's all through the Old Testament. When Adam heard God walking in the garden, that was Jesus. Whenever God manifests in the human form, it's always Jesus. This is in the Old Testament. But it didn't do most of them any good when push came to shove. They were right about Jesus, but they had them all wrong. And today, most of the church in the United States and other Western countries, they're right about Jesus. But we've got them all wrong. My prayer for you and your family and this church is the same as my prayer for myself and my family and our church in England where I live, same prayer. They had them all wrong. May we not have them all wrong. By the grace of God, may we learn the lessons of Israel. May we see him as he really is. May we understand what's really going to happen before he gets here. They had him as the Messiah. But they didn't understand him. We understand him as the Christ. But we don't understand him. Some did. Not many, but some did. And when he comes again, some will. My prayer for us is that by the grace of the God of Israel, we will be among them. Thank you, Pastor. 